and I'd like to thank all the, the committed and innovative and hardworking online practitioners um, that are participating in, in the summit. I understand it is the 19th, so next year will be a big deal, and that it started out with three people in a room maybe having coffee, Alexandra, a number of years ago. So congratulations to you and for your leadership. You know, it's grown now to an online community of about 177,000 students, and I, I'm not sure how to count the degrees, but I'm, I'm told there's 528. I'm sure there's more than that. So, um, And I'd also you know, like to thank the Open SUNY community, including the, the campus, campuses, administration, the staff, faculty, and the students who have a long history of, of online teaching and learning. Um, understand yesterday we also recognize the online teaching ambassadors so congratulations for your enthusiasm in bringing online and uh, I'd also like to thank the Open SUNY executive director Kim Scalzo, Larry Dugan from Monroe Community College for chairing the advisory board and to all the Open SUNY staff for the commitment to online teaching and learning. And lastly, special thanks to Nancy Montaldo and the SUNY Global Center and the SUNY Center for Professional Development for all the conference support as well as the resources that go into hosting this kind of summit. In my inaugural State of the University System address, I talked about four themes that really I hope will inform and guide as well as drive my chancellorship, and they were innovation and entrepreneurship individualized education, energy and sustainability, and partnerships. And I think those four things uh, are definitely woven within the DNA of the online community. So think about innovation. Um, I admit when I was a faculty member and before I was uh, running a clean energy company, I spent 25 years in the academy, so I've been a professor, I've been a dean, I've been a provost for my sins. Um, mostly the provost was for my sins because when I was dean, I was a pain to my provost. So, I, yeah, pay, payback is, you know what. Anyway, um, I remember a colleague of mine who was an accounting professor at the University of Col uh, Colorado at Denver, and I was at the University of Colorado in Boulder, talking about online and that she was doing a class online. I mean, this was back a long time ago. Anyway, at least in the 90s, and I thought, that's never going to go anywhere. No one's going to do this. Why would you ever want to do online when you can be in the classroom, you know, with the uh, with the professor? Well, it won't be the first time I was wrong, um, and I'm sure it won't be the last time. But it it is so Im important, and to be innovative. And and as we look at Internet 1.0 and 2.0, I'm I'm really excited to see what will come out of this summit in terms of the innovation and the entrepreneurship and what we can do to build the online platform. Um, we are the largest comprehensive, as you know, university system in the country. I want to be the largest online university system in the country, and I need you all to help us, you know, do that. So um, I, I'm also, uh, so the second one is all about individualized education. And when I think about individualized education, I think about how we can use technology. And this, to me, is a little bit of the online 2.0 that you'll all invent. But uh, there is a, uh, a, a mathematical paradox that was done back in the 1850s by a German um, mathematician and philosopher called Brace. And it's called Brace's Paradox. And I only read about it because I think... Oh, about 25 years ago, they were closing down part of uh, 42nd Street, and they were concerned that they were going to have a lot of traffic jams. And actually, as it turned out, they didn't have as many traffic jams. And the reason why, and it went back to Brace's Paradox, is Brace's Paradox says the most efficient way to get through a network, whether it's a transportation network, and I would argue an educational network, is not to give a gazillion possibilities or a neural network like our brains, but to give a few so you think about when we were kids, I used to do mazes all the time. I don't know if you did. I was, I was just, I loved the, the um, you're in the medical uh, doctor's office, and they had the highlights, and you had to find, you know, it's sort of the precursor to where's Waldo, right? So I love finding all those and working puzzles. And it was pretty quick to realize that if you wanted to work a maze, you don't start at the beginning and get lost. You start at the end, and you work backwards because you know there's a path. Well, it's kind of like Brace's Paradox. If you start at the end, it cuts down the kind of pathways you can go. And so what I see, think about with individualized education is can we use advanced learning techniques, semantic ontology, and other ways to look at a student's 
background, their avocation and their vocation, and help them plot a path through this maze we called SUNY. And I think SUNY online is an element in what we need to do to be helpful. Then I would say that the next piece in terms of individualized education is they can't stop when they graduate, right? So I, I have challenged many IT companies, and I sit on the board of Cisco. I said, tell me what you think the education cloud looks like. Nobody can tell me what the education cloud looks like. They're scared of it. And it's not just, it's not Cisco, it could be Palantir, it can be IBM, it could be any IT company I've talked to. Tell me what the education cloud is. And they don't know. I think it's pretty simple. You know, we need an education cloud where you can record and store every note, problem set, memo, lecture in the cloud. And then as knowledge evolves, that you immediately get it downloaded to your endpoint device. Who knows what that's going to be in 20 years from now? I, in, most likely, it won't be exactly looking like a, an iPad or, or a, a, cell, a smartphone, but there will be a way that we will be connected to this. I think SUNY has the opportunity to invent what that education cloud looks like, and we have to get after it now, and it's going to really depend on, on you all here. So that's sort of the second thing. And fortunately, we're recruiting a new provost, and that's going to be him or her thing to lead, right? And so innovation entrepreneurship is about increasing our breadth and our scope of our scholarly work, including research and scholarly activities. Individualized education is going to be figuring out what is the education cloud, what is the role of online in that, and working together in that ecosystem. The third one, which I find fascinating, and uh, part of my work is I worked in the Obama administration as Undersecretary of Energy, and I, I actually we set a path for it called the Strategic Technology Energy Plan, or the STEP forward that we have to make in order to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions 83 percent by 2050. Well, how does that affect online? So I Googled this morning as I was thinking about what I would say to all y'all who know a whole lot more about online than, than this Luddite. And what I realized uh, is that there's an article that uh, was written, actually it's a, uh, it was written in a current opinion in environmental uh, stability. And uh, I'm probably not pronouncing this name correctly, but Verstage in Len. Dutch, so anybody Dutch here? Yeah, well look it up, it's good. Um, so it says that the scope three emissions in higher education institutions, and scope three are travel related emissions by our students and our staff, are anywhere between 40 and 90% of the entire carbon footprint of higher education. Now, okay, I only Googled it this morning, I have not fully read the paper and it costs $9.90 to download, I haven't done that yet because I, but I will, because I think that's also something that's important. Uh, now, having said that, you have to offset it by, of course, the cost of actually the computers that allow us and the visualization tools to do online. So we need more work on this. But clearly, it's part of the solution. So in terms of the third theme of my chancellorship, um, is that we're going to reduce the carbon footprint of SUNY and the two things that I said in the state of the university system was, one, all new physical infrastructure will be zero net carbon, starting now, designing. So last night I was at the Citizens Budget Commission dinner, and I uh, ran into folks who build dorms. And they want to build another dorm for a particular school. I said, oh, that's great. You know it now has to be zero net carbon emissions. And they looked at me and said, absolutely. So you just Got to go there. Uh, lastly, it's all about partnerships. And I know that, at least from uh, talking with Alex, that this online community was started from a grant from the Sloan Foundation. And when we think about partnerships, it's something that we have the capability to partner not only throughout SUNY, but throughout the state throughout the country, throughout the world. And again, online gives us that reach. So I, I couldn't have been more thrilled to become chancellor when, than when I found out about the wonderful you know, SUNY online program that we have. So I just want to um, leave you with a few of those thoughts and just thank you for your good work. Uh, thank you for all the wonderful ideas that you're developing and the best practices. And I look forward to getting a readout from today. Have another wonderful, productive day and working with you to evolve uh, online to 2.0. So thank you very much and um, have a great day. Thank you.